and welcome. Thank you for tuning in to our special talk with Dr. Hideo Mabuchi. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that none of this would be possible without the collaboration and support from our administration and faculty, specifically Dr. Nandigam, Chris Leonard, Dr. Cortez, Dr. Cervantes, and Patricia Ballinger, who they all helped from the beginning to organize um, the exhibit and idea. I would also like to thank Anna Nauman and Betty Montejano for all the hands-on work of hanging and talking to people and getting everything up and finished. Hideo Mabuchi earned a PhD in physics from the California Institute of Technology and a AB in physics from Princeton University. Mabuchi teaches and conducts research as a professor of applied physics at Stanford University, where he has developed courses that integrate art and science. Mabuchi has previously been named the MacArthur Fellow in recognition of the creativity of his scientific work. So Hideo, thank you so much for being here with us, uh, taking time out of your day and sharing your knowledge and experience with us. Thanks, Gina. Thanks for that uh, very kind introduction. And thanks to all of you over there for the opportunity to show some work and, and uh, give a lecture like this. OK, good luck. So thanks. Let me just uh, get into my screen share. OK, involution, a spiraling inward intricacy. Clay consists of weathered minerals of the Earth's crust. In a broad sense, it relates to landscape. When I come across a natural clay deposit on my travels, I like to photograph it in place. Here's a little ball of clay from a glacial outwash fan in Iceland. This is a large deposit of white kaolin kaolinitic clay on the island of Kimolos in the Greek Cyclades. Some riverbank clay in Patagonia. And ground clays from various deposits in Amazonian Brazil, including one from a prison yard we had special permission to dig in for an art project. In fact, <clears throat> clays of various kinds can be found pretty much anywhere on earth. Historically, this enabled the independent development of many distinct pottery traditions starting many thousands of years ago by indigenous peoples across the globe. Today, it means that clay can be a relatively inexpensive material to source. And as a ceramist, you may be able to work with local clays from the geological region that you live in. If you choose to work using traditional craft methods, I think this can create a powerful sense of continuity with prior generations of potters. When we form clay by hand, <clears throat> we often feel that it has a mind of its own. In my artwork, I like to highlight some of the textures that clay develops spontaneously as we manipulate it. For example, the spiraling wrinkle texture on the inner surface of the mouth of the piece shown on this slide. So I'm kind of meaning this stuff here. Um, this texture appears on its own if I just don't touch that surface at all while I'm constricting the outer surface of the clay to close in the bottleneck. This sort of magic inward spiraling texture is one of the main inspirations for the title of the show, Involution. This piece, which is in the show, is shown on the left just after I finished forming it on my potter's wheel with the clay still in a raw, unfired state. The image on the right is the top view of the same piece after firing, and the clay is taken on rich color tones of mottled red on black. Note that there's no glaze applied to the piece. This type of color develops solely from the natural iron content of clays, like the, the uh, Northern California stoneware clay I formulated for my studio work. This specific type of red on black effect appears as a result of firing the clay in a wood burning kiln and carefully controlling the oxygen level of the kiln atmosphere after the firing as the pieces are cooling. You can imagine that for someone with a physical sciences background, seeing this drastic transformation from the raw clay on the left to the fired clay on the right really makes you wonder what's going on at a microscopic level to give rise to all this color and why it matters so much, precisely how the piece is fired and cooled. In the rest of this talk, my main goal will be to try to convey some of the wonder of what one finds by looking into such microscopic details 
using modern scientific equipment, including optical and electron microscopes. The amazing intricacy such study reveals is the second main inspiration for the title of the show. If you're interested after the webinar, you can see the artwork and microscope images included in the show uh, by going to my website, uh, firemouse.me, clicking on the little uh, hamburger icon that's at the upper right corner of the, of the landing page. And then there'll be a listing of, uh, of pages and one of them is titled Involution. So you can just click on that. Now, I realized that many people in the audience aren't uh, yet familiar with wood-fired ceramics. So I wanted to uh, show a few slides to provide a quick overview of the process as we get started. So this here is an image of a kiln while it's still being built, actually. Uh, this is a kiln up at the uh, Banff Center in Canada that um, I was lucky to be able to help to build. And um, I like this view just because you can see the main parts of the kiln. And um, let me just go over those quickly. Uh, over here on this side of the image, you can see the chimney of the kiln, which is really the most important part. Um, and it's kind of extending up through the, the, the roof of the kiln shed. Now going backwards, so to speak, uh, this part of the kiln here is the stacking chamber. So this is where uh, you'll put ceramics that are going to be fired in this kiln. And there's a little door in the side here and you actually have to kind of crawl in through that door, stack up all your pieces in the stacking chamber and then you can brick up the door uh, to close up the kiln when you're ready to fire. The real business happens up here. This is the firebox for this sort of kiln. And so this is the place in the kiln where you'll actually be, where, where one actually throws wood. So the wood burns here, but then the draw of the chimney, you know, there's all this hot air rushing up through the chimney. And since there's hot air rushing out of the kiln here, it has to suck in some other air behind it. And the idea is that that air actually gets sucked in from the firebox down through the stacking chamber on its way out to the chimney. So all of the really complex, rich atmosphere from burning wood, you know, there are a lot of gases get released by the burning wood and there's a lot of fly ash as well. All of that stuff kind of gets sucked through the stacking chamber. It drastically affects the development of the surfaces of, your, of the pots um, and then it heads out the chimney. So some kind of um, live action shots from firing. So uh, in these two panels, you can kind of see people stoking wood into the firebox. Uh, oftentimes you find that you have to kind of go in there with an iron rod and rearrange the wood that's uh, piling up in the firebox. And then um, here's an image of what sometimes happens with the chimney where you can see the flames coming from the burning wood and the combustible gases that the wood gives off. They will uh, kind of push themselves all the way up through the top of the chimney. And so if uh, all this flame and kind of complex turbulent atmosphere makes it up uh, all the way out the top of the chimney, you know that the pots inside are also just bathing in all of that. And so um, that's one maybe sort of visceral way you can imagine uh, the, the kind of strong effect that the kiln atmosphere itself can have on the development of the ceramic surfaces. So as I mentioned, there's this little uh, loading door um, in the kiln. And so here's a, a picture of some people actually unloading pots after a firing. Right, so somebody has climbed in, is sitting on the kiln floor, uh, taking pots carefully out of the stack and handing them out to somebody. Now, if you were to go into this loading door, this photo here is actually taken uh, before the firing, right? So when the pots are first being loaded into the kiln. But the view is basically if you're sitting at this location and looking downstream towards the chimney, um, this is the view that there was. That's how I, that's what I did when I took this photo. And so here can, you can see there's a lot of um, kiln furniture, as we call it, kind of stacked up. So this is basically some uh, a very high temperature durable shelving that goes into the kiln. And so you can arrange the pots that need to be fired in there. And if you look at these, um, I think there's hardly any glaze on any of these pieces, if any at all. There are several different kinds of clay represented among the pots. You can see that some of them are a lighter color, some of them are a slightly more pinkish color. Uh, but you know, for the most part, they are uniform and the colors are, are, are fairly mild before the firing. So now um, you, know, you finish stacking the kiln, you break up the, the, the loading door. A firing for this kind of a kiln will typically last for about 48 hours, something like that, so two days of firing during which time uh, crews of people have to be uh, constantly stoking wood into the firebox um, and kind of monitoring the progress of the firing, adjusting some things about the chimney uh, and the air intakes. After that's done, you typically need to let a kiln like this cool off for a couple of days before you can actually open up the loading door and go in and take out your pots. 
But then here's a view of that same stack after the firing is over. Uh, so some things you clearly see is there's a bunch of ash that's piled up on the floor of the kiln. And then um, all of the pots have taken on a range of colors. And down closer to the floor, uh, where pots were um, sitting closer to some actual kind of coals and embers, uh, you'll often get these blue-gray sorts of shades appearing. And then higher up, you'll see some surfaces that are more in the red to orange, little brown kind of uh, color spectrum. And it's hard to even really appreciate the colors in a photograph like this, <clears throat> just because it's uh, not very good uh, lighting conditions, et cetera. But if we uh, move on to some kind of studio photos, so after you've taken your pots out and kind of cleaned them up and take photographs of them under nice lighting conditions, um, I just included a few slides here to convey the kind of range of color and the varied surface textures that you can end up with in this kind of a, a wood firing. So as I was mentioning, the kind of blue-gray spectrum, oranges and reds, um, there are various ways that you might end up with some greens. Uh, often, often you'll get these sorts of purpley browns. Uh, just a few more for range. Um, again, reds, blues, oranges. And then I think one more set. They'll sometimes go over more into yellow or gold sorts of color tones. Uh, occasionally, colors that I don't even quite know what to call that. Uh, and then things uh, that are sort of green. But so there's, there's quite a range of color that you can develop in this sort of a firing. And again, this is not because there have been glazes applied for the pieces, but really it's something very fundamental about the interaction of the elements that are just present in the clay itself the way they interact with the complex atmosphere in the kiln at very high temperatures, and then even more importantly, what exactly happens as the kiln cools. So, you know, I started off the talk by mentioning that clay uh, consists of weathered minerals of the Earth's crust, and so the composition of clay is really not uh, unlike the composition of just, you know, the, the Earth's surface. And in a wood firing like this, what you generally observe is that at the top temperatures of the firing, the very surface skin of all of the ceramic pots is actually a little bit molten, right? So you get a, a kind of a liquid skin on the pots when you're at the highest temperatures. You can really see this if you look in through a peephole during the firing. You can see the surfaces of the pots turned really shimmery and a little, uh, a little glassy. And so that molten clay, it's really not that unlike uh, lava or magma. It's just kind of melted minerals of the Earth's crust. And so then after the firing is over and you start to allow the pieces to cool, you have this process where you're kind of cooling down from that aluminosilicate melt, from that magma-like state. And so if you think about what happens when a volcano erupts and uh, magma is released on the Earth's surface, and then as that magma cools, um, you can have the formation of various minerals, crystals, things like that. And so our, our general understanding of where most of this color comes from is that the specific kinds of colors that you'll get will depend a lot on both what sorts of extra things get added onto the surface because of the fact that it's in a wood kiln. So like what kinds of ash gets deposited on the surface. But even in the areas where there hasn't been any particulate ash deposited, the details of the way all of those elements cool and the sorts of microcrystals that they form during cooling, those are the details that determine exactly what sorts of colors and surface textures you'll end up with the pots by the time you're able to actually take them out of the kiln. So as I was saying, this is something that is really super fascinating for a, a physicist who also works in clay. Uh, and I have to acknowledge that um, the first sort of pointer that I got to kind of uh, point me in the right direction for how to study these things as a physicist was reading uh, papers by a, a Japanese group um, led by uh, Kusano and, and Fukuhara, where they for a number of decades actually have been doing scientific studies on specific kinds of red markings that are seen in traditional Japanese stonewares from the Bizen region. Um, and so on the left-hand side of this slide, you can see some sort of before pictures. So there's uh, unfired clay pots, some bottles and a vase. And you can see that they've been bundled up or wrapped up with what looks like straw. And in fact, this is a, a traditional thing to do. Um, you can imagine that if you're firing a wood burning kiln, which involves um, using a lot of firewood and a lot of manual labor to do the firing, you would ideally like to get as many pots into the kiln as possible when you're going to fire it. So often you want to be kind of stacking the pots either very closely to one another, or let's say if you have cups or bowls or plates, you can actually literally stack them. But you want to try to um, take care that these things don't fuse to one another during the firing. 
because uh, that would wreck them. You wouldn't really be able to use them. And as it turns out, one way that you can keep uh, pieces from sticking to one another is by wrapping them in, in rice straw or, or similar materials like that. And that's because rice straw, when you burn it, uh, what gets left is actually mostly pure silica. And silica is actually a, a very high temperature refractory material. So it's a really good kind of spacer or buffer between ceramic pieces, even at the very high temperatures we have in a firing. Which, by the way, um, if you like to think in Fahrenheit, these firings will often go to, will typically go to 2200, 2300, 2400 degrees Fahrenheit. So 1200, 1300 degrees Celsius, that sort of range. But um, so kind of serendipitously, what people discovered over time is that by wrapping pots in rice straw like this, then after the firing is done, there's a very carefully taken sort of after photo of exactly the same pots after a firing. And the first thing that you'll notice is that the straw has turned into these sort of ghostly white wispy things. So what you're seeing there is just sort of the silica particles that are left after burning out all of the organic content of, of this rice straw. But maybe you can make out that underneath where the rice straw was, you can actually see these distinctive red markings. And so um, to look at some of those more closely, here's a bowl fired in a similar way where the, the residue of the rice straw has now been taken off. And you can see these um, very deep red markings um, uh, that were the object of this particular scientific study. And so, you know, it's interesting to wonder what's going on here because there's only, you know, this entire bowl is made up of one kind of clay, but for some reason where you've had the rice straw, underneath there, you get these strong red markings and everywhere else the clay remains this sort of beige color. Uh, and so what uh, Kusano and Fukuhara and coworkers were able to do uh, was to use um, uh, actually quite sophisticated electron microscope techniques to study in great detail what does the crystal structure of the clay surface look like in these areas that have remained beige versus what do they look like in the areas that have turned red. And so um, this is really, I mean, this is an amazing photo to me. If you, this is an image from the transmission electron microscope. So this is at, you know, a really very high degree of magnification. Uh, but what you see is um, these intriguing structures where there's a sort of uh, what looks like a, a, a light, lighter colored, you know, quasi hexagonal platelet underneath, and these somewhat darker colored, smaller hexagonal or pieces of hexagon uh, kind of places uh, uh, crystals um, decorating the edge. And so they were able to show that these little things that are dotted around the outside, those are iron oxide crystals. And they're iron oxide crystals of a kind that we know tends to um, show a red color. Uh, this central hexagon, on the other hand, is alumina, corundum. Uh, it's kind of a, it's the clear form of sapphire. But um, somehow what happens as the surfaces of these pots are cooling are that first you get the formation of these little, uh, these kind of sapphire templates. And then the iron oxide crystals will sort of get seeded and grow onto the edge of those. But it's the creation of all these very small little um, iron oxide crystals. <clears throat> That's what ends up being responsible for the formation of this bright red color that you see. And so why does this only happen underneath where the rice straw was wrapped? Well, something that they established in their research is that when you um, burn the rice straw, you know, what gets left behind is silica. But another thing that happens is that a lot of potassium gets given off by the straw as it's burning. And so potassium in ceramics, we know is a kind of element where if you add potassium or sodium to clay, it tends to make that clay more melty. And so um, in a firing like this, what ends up happening is that the sections or the, the regions of the clay that are directly underneath the straw wrappings, they receive some extra potassium. So they're more melty. And so those regions at the highest temperature of these firings actually does become kind of liquid and melty. And so as that part cools, all of the elements in those regions of the surface are able to move around and rearrange themselves. And the most important rearrangement is the formation of these sorts of structures where you're able to make these red iron oxide crystals. In parts of the clay that are not uh, covered by the rice straw, they don't get the extra dose of potassium. So they don't quite melt at the highest temperatures of the firing. And therefore the elements in those parts of the clay are not uh, able to move around so that they can form these red iron oxide crystals during the cooling. So, you know, from this, I, I learned some, interesting, some important things. First of all, that you can use these sorts of modern microscope techniques to get uh, sort of a, a really super high magnification view that helps you understand what kinds of crystals are responsible for the formation of the color. 
And also you learn about the importance of the role of things like um, potassium and sodium in uh, creating some variation uh, in terms of what colors form on which parts of, of the pots during the firing and cooling. So one of the first um, fun sciencey kind of things that I did after um, reading about all of this in a uh, great work by the Japanese group was to first ask, well, if I'm just doing a, a wood firing and I haven't used any of this uh, uh, straw wrapping, is something similar happening in a regular wood firing that could be responsible for the formation of these uh, kinds of red colors? And so for that, you know, the intuition was something like, I, I knew from having read uh, various uh, textbooks and whatever, that when you burn wood, the wood itself, as you burn it, will give off potassium and sodium, which will then just be circulating in the atmosphere of the kiln uh, as, the, as the atmosphere goes from the firebox off to the chimney. And so, um, but is there a lot of it? Is there enough of it present that um, you could expect it to create this sort of melty effect on uh, all of the exposed surfaces of the pots? And so one thing that I did was just, um, this is a little, actually a gas burning kiln that I built at Stanford. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's a very uh, homemade sort of kiln. And the chimney of it is just this little stub here. But the exhaust from the, this kiln kind of goes up in this direction. And uh, so uh, then um, I set something up where there's a, uh, a white light laser that shines a, a, a laser beam across the top of the, of the gas flue. And then after that, that laser light has gone through the gas flue, it's collected by a detector on the other side. And with this setup, you can actually look uh, differentially to see uh, of all the different colors that are present in the white light laser, how strongly do those different colors get absorbed by the gas that's coming out of this kiln? And I should uh, say that it's a gas burning kiln, but as we're doing this kind of experiment, we actually introduce some wood ash into the kiln so that that wood ash is burned by the hot, uh, the hot atmosphere in the kiln. And so you create conditions that are similar to those that you would expect to see in a wood burning kiln. And so this pot up here, it's a little bit hard to, to make much sense of, but basically the different colors are spread out over this axis of the plot. And then this kind of fuzzy shape here is kind of a representation both of how much of each color is my white light laser making in the first place, but then also how much of it actually survives transmitting through the, the flute, the, the exit gas coming out of, the, out of the kiln. And so you might be able to see that there's a kind of a sharp dip here and a sharp dip, actually two sharp dips right here. And if you look and see exactly what colors those are that are being um, uh, specifically absorbed uh, by whatever is coming out of the flue of this kiln, um, you can see that they line up exactly with where you expect sodium or potassium uh, to absorb light um, if you have a lot of sodium and potassium in, in, the, uh, in the exit gas. And so this kind of thing, you, know, you can directly convince yourself that, yes, there is actually a lot of sodium and potassium just kind of always in the atmosphere of a kiln that's burning wood. And so um, here on the left, this is a picture of a pot that was fired in that kiln. And so I wanted to focus on some area that was, you know, not that deep, dark uh, scarlet red that you saw in the Japanese work, but sort of a pink or salmon blush color. And so just, you know, cut a piece out of that pot. So just this piece down here, uh, and then started to look at this using various kinds of microscopes that we have um, available in our facilities at Stanford. And so here in these two images, um, you can now see, this is just with a regular optical microscope. So you can imagine just looking at this with a very powerful magnifying lens. So these are structures that you could just see by looking with your own eyes through, through a powerful uh, high magnification microscope. And you can indeed see exactly these structures that the Japanese group was talking about where you have parts of things that look like maybe clear hexagonal platelets, but then all around the edges of those hexagons, you see that there's a, a, a red coloration, right? So already I'm thinking that, oh, this is exactly what they were talking about that you have these little sapphire platelets that form, and then um, little red iron oxide crystals can, uh, can nucleate around the edges of that. And so, you know, if you take images like this and then just zoom way, way, way out, you know, you just imagine like a giant field of these things. By the time you've zoomed all the way out that you're just at regular, um, at regular magnification, what your eye sees is it just sort of averages over all of this and sees sort of a pink or salmon color. But really what's contributing that color are these little red iron oxide crystals that have uh, nucleated around the edges of these um, of these uh, sapphire platelets? And just for scale, I should I should mention that 
you know, typically these clear hexagonal platelets are something like 10 microns in scale. So that would mean that, um, you know, let's say this area represented in the lower central uh, photograph, that's probably something like this, this width is something like the width of a human hair. So 80, 100 microns, something like that. Now, it's tempting to ask, you know, can you look at this at even higher magnification to see what's going on? Um, for that, um, you can no longer do that with an optical microscope. So we have to switch over to using uh, electron microscopes and similar equipment. Just to give you a feeling for what that means um, in practice. So this is an image of one of the electron microscopes that we have at Stanford. And over here for scale, you know, there's a regular computer keyboard and some monitors. And so on this instrument, um, maybe you can make out there's a little handlebar there. So um, you can basically pull that handlebar and this front door sort of slides open a little bit. You stick your sample in there, close that front door. You have to suck then suck all the air out of the chamber. So you use a vacuum pump to take out all the air. And then the way that you actually see things is um, this column here produces a beam of electrons. These electrons bounce off the surface of your sample. Um, the scattered electrons are collected by various detectors, but then you basically need a computer to process all of that and reconstruct um, a sensible looking image for you. And, and we'll look at some of those um, uh, from this point on in the talk. So uh, the, the kinds of images that you get from an electron microscope are really just black and white. They're, they're no longer color images that you can see. Uh, you can no longer see real color um, with an electron microscope the way that you would see it with your eyes. But if you've already looked at your sample with an optical microscope to get a sense of how the color correlates with the structures that you see, then when you look at the electron microscope images, you can start to interpret what's going on. You know, so here, for example, is an electron microscope uh, image at, at very high magnification. Uh, and so here, this scale bar here is just four microns, right? So this kind of scale bar on this image represents about the 20th of a human hair's width. And so you can see one of those uh, hexagons that I was talking about. And you can, in fact, see that there's a lot of stuff kind of piled up around the edges. Um, you could just sort of zoom in even further on one of these edges, uh, take a closer look at it. If it <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to interpret this, but that's what those edges actually look like. And then um, using a, an even fancier kind of machine, we have this thing called the NanoSims. Uh, I was able to zoom in on one of these hexagons. And what this instrument is able to do then is also to not only show you a high magnification image of one of these hexagons, but it can, uh, it can um, fairly accurately determine what kinds of atoms are present in the different regions of your image. So for example, here, um, this is a, a false color image, but um, in this false color reconstruction, uh, aluminum atoms are shown as blue pixels, or well, let's say regions where there are high concentrations of aluminum atoms are shown as blue pixels. Regions where there's a high concentration of silicon atoms are shown as green pixels. In regions where there are high concentrations of iron atoms are shown as uh, these reddish kind of pixels. And so you can completely directly see here in this, uh, in this data that the background material is something that has a lot of silicon in it, which is exactly what you expect because clay has a lot of silicon in it. But the central part of this hexagon is mostly aluminum, aluminum oxide, uh, corundum, sapphire, all names for the same thing. But then the iron atoms are very tightly clustered around the edges of these hexagons, just as was originally established by, by the Japanese material science group. So we can go in and you know, very directly get, uh, we can very directly see that this sort of color formation mechanism is in fact at work in a fairly general class of um, reddish colors that you'll see on wood fired ceramics and not just in the straw wrapped pieces that the Japanese group was originally uh, studying. So I want to turn on and tell one more story about this uh, microscopic kind of stuff. And uh, I'm turning now to then a specific kind of red coloration that appears on uh, pieces when they're fired the way that I like to fire them. And here, um, this is uh, work now that uh, I originally started um, in collaboration with Dan Murphy, who's a professor of ceramics at Utah State University in Logan, Utah. And Dan is the one, uh, well, Dan was the person who led the kiln building at Banff, uh, where I, I showed the kiln construction um, at the beginning of the talk. And Dan is also the person who first introduced me to so-called reduction cool wood firing, which is the type of firing strategy you need to follow 
in order to get these sorts of um, surfaces on, on your pots. And it may not be obvious if you're not really used to looking at these sorts of um, ceramics, but the particular kind of red surfaces that you get through a reduction pool, they're, they're distinct from the kinds that we were just looking at on the past few slides, right? Like if I um, go back to you know, this piece here, uh, you can probably make out the surface here is a little glassy and the colors that we're talking about are not super saturated. They're, they're reddish colors that I think in the pottery world, we would tend to refer to as flashing colors. So a little bit more on the cherry blossom side of things. Whereas when I'm talking about reduction cool reds, when they really work out, um, they're really kind of thick and velvety. Like they almost have a slightly fuzzy look about them. And they're, they tend to be a deeper sort of red and they tend to appear on a background, which is actually black. Um, so these are a couple of pieces um, that I made uh, that are reduction cool reds. Uh, this one's actually in the show. And so um, Dan and I just asked the question, is the formation of these reduction cool reds the same kind of mechanism as we saw in the lighter flashing color, or is it something completely different? And so um, we've done a number of kind of uh, test firings or experimental firings um, at Utah State University, and then brought the samples back to Stanford to look at them. But mostly what we've done is um, things where we made some specific test pieces that went in the kiln. Um, so here's actually a view through a hole in the side of the kiln uh, that you can sort of see how these, um, how these uh, test pieces were stacked in. And um, one of the things that we know about reduction pool reds is that you tend to find them on surfaces that were a little bit hidden during the firing. So with these pieces, if you turn them up, you'll find that the strong reduction reds mainly uh, happen on the undersides of the pieces or also on the, on the back sides that were facing away from the firebox. So in this picture, the firebox is on this side. So gases and ash are kind of flowing in this direction in this direction through the pieces. So the backs that were a little bit in the lee of all the wood ash and then the bottoms that were kind of hidden, those are the places where you mostly will see these reduction coal reds. And so what we'll do is pick out a good sample, um, use a Dremel tool to cut out a little chunk of it, um, if we like these sorts of test pieces because the surfaces are flat, that makes them easy to work with in a microscope. And so if you zoom in on one of those, um, again, this is just with a regular optical microscope. So basically like looking through a magnifying glass, um, you can see that there's quite a lot of detail there. And first of all, you know, I just want to note that, you know, we tend to just think of these things as reds. And if you look at them from far away, in fact, they're just kind of red. But if you look at them at some magnification, you see that they're actually very richly varied so there's a whole lot of structure going on. And uh, maybe you'll believe me, maybe you won't, but you might already start to get the feeling that there are some patches on a surface like this that are slightly reddish, like they're a little bit more like purple, but then you'll look, you'll kind of come into regions where the red is more intense. So it's almost like, like you're looking at vegetation or like the growth of um, lichen on a rock or something like that, where there's some places where the growth is thin. And so you see a lot of the color of whatever they're sitting on top of. Which in, many case, which in this case I'll, I'll tell you is black. But then in other places, whatever growth there is is much thicker. And in those places, what you really see is the color of the stuff that's growing. And so that, that's the first little clue that you can see already uh, emerging at, at this level of magnification. So now to go into a higher level of magnification, we're again gonna have to switch over to looking at electron microscope images, which are uh, just black and white. But what I'll try to do here is help you to sort of see the correspondence of what's red and what's black in these images. So down here in the right-hand corner of this slide, I have a, just a detail from the bottom of one of those test pieces. And so you can see there are a lot of like glassy blast black chunks that you can see embedded on the surface. There's a sort of halo of stuff right here, which is a really thick ketchupy red. And then for whatever reason, we've got some stuff in the middle here, which is sort of silvery gray. So, um, on the left side of this slide, what you have is a scanning electron microscope image of more or less the same area on this, on this test piece. And so with your eye, hopefully, you know, this silvery patch is kind of shaped like a, a, a manta ray or a ginkgo leaf or something like that. And so hopefully you can kind of make out that there's an outline like this, right, which is that same manta ray or ginkgo leaf kind of region, right? So this region, in here, when you look at it at higher magnification with the electron microscope, that's, that's this region. And you can even identify that there's this um, one kind of glassy black chunk right here underneath my cursor right now. 
That's what that little glassy black chunk. That's right here on this image. And then you've got like this bigger glassy chunk here and a smaller one underneath it. So that on the electron microscope image is that guy and that guy. Right. So um, now what I want to do is just zoom in. Uh, oh, sorry. The one other thing I needed to mention was in the uh, scanning electron microscope, in addition to be able to look at things at high resolution, high magnification, you can also do a similar sort of thing as what I showed with the nanosims, where you can try to assess what are the dominant types of atoms that are located in different areas of the surface that you're imaging. So here again, you know that same uh, manta ray ginkgo leaf shaped region. And then in this image here, this is another false color image that you can make using the scanning electron microscope. But in this image, this upper image here, the pixels are bright or dark according to how much iron is there. Right, so kind of what you can see is that there's a lot of iron through most of this region, except in these little spots, which are dark in this image. And these are spots where there's really not very much iron on the surface. Uh, and I should emphasize actually that this sort of technique is mostly telling you about what kinds of atoms are sitting on the surface. Now down here, this is a similar sort of image, except that the pixels are bright or dark, depending on, whether, on how much silicon you have sitting on the surface. And so what you'll immediately make out is that these particular spots that are dark in iron are very bright in silicon. And if we go back and try to line those up with what you see in the regular optical image, what you can conclude is that the glassy black chunks that you see in the regular color optical image, those are the places, so you know this guy, uh, let's see, that guy and that guy, right? So this, that, and that, that is this spot, that spot and that spot, which is that spot, that spot, and that spot, right? So the areas that have this glassy black appearance, those are areas where mostly what's present on the surface is silicon as opposed to iron. Whereas the other regions that are either the silver metallic -y region or the bright red region around it, those areas are actually um, largely iron. And then, and then there's oxygen everywhere. Uh, that, that's a separate part of the story. But what was most amazing about the results of this uh, particular um, study is that you could see that um, if you ask, so how much iron is present in these um, red areas, which are the red uh, responsible for the reduction for reds, it's actually a huge amount. Um, it, it seems like on some samples that um, the very surface patches which have this strong red, they can be up to 50% iron by weight. Uh, which is really kind of amazing because the clay itself, like if, if you just ask about the average composition of the clay, the clay that we put into the kiln is only about 3% iron by weight. So some kind of magic process happens in this firing and reduction cooling process that increases the relative concentration of iron at the surface in certain areas, which is what gives rise to this incredibly rich, vibrant um, red color. And so, you know, a final clue about what might be going on if we just um, look back at the same uh, detail. So here, uh, this electron microscope image on the left is a region that's approximately where the yellow X is. And you can't quite see the detail, but what you're actually looking at in the electron microscope image is the boundary between one of those black glassy kind of regions and a bright red region around it, right? So this area here, which kind of looks like the surface of a frozen lake, this corresponds in the true color um, image to a glassy black part. But then it looks like, you know, around the edges of that frozen lake, you've got these giant piles of rubble. But remember these giant piles of rubble are mostly uh, iron. This, black, this uh, kind of frozen lake surface is most silicon. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, it's still red iron oxide. You know, that's what's responsible for the color. But rather than having those, you know, delicate little hexagonal structures that we saw before in the lighter flashing colors, here in the reduction cool red, they're just like giant piles and piles and piles of these uh, iron oxide crystals, which is why those colors can be so intense and even look a little bit fuzzy. Um, uh, to even to your eye. And so if we zoom in a little bit more, you may see that you know, there are things in this um, frozen lake surface, so to speak, that are kind of like little fissures. So you can zoom in on one of those. And so here's an image like that. And so you can see, especially in this part down here, it actually looks like you know, even in the middle of this frozen lake, there are little patches where it's almost like these, uh, these piles of iron oxide rubble 
are actually like bursting out from underneath the, the frozen lake surface. All right, so I think this is a really nice example of one of those things. And then here are a few more. So, you know, if you imagine that, you know, metaphorically, that's actually what happens, right? That somehow, because of the way that these pieces are fired and cooled, you get iron that starts out kind of in the depth of the clay, but during the firing and cooling process, it kind of gets, for some reason, sucked up to the surface and kind of actually busts up out of the surface and even starts kind of growing up and piling up, uh, sort of like, like lichen or moss coming out of the surface of your ceramic. But, you know, that, that would give you a reason why it's possible for there to be 50% iron on the surface of the clay, even when you know that generally through the bulk of the clay, it's only supposed to be 3% iron, right? That some force is really pulling iron atoms up to the surface, uh, which gives you those, these interesting kinds of structures and um, allows you to have these very vibrant red colors. And so um, having looked at that, you know, I started just trying to study in the material science literature, has anybody ever studied stuff like this, right? Where iron gets pulled up to the surface of, a, of a, a, an aluminosilicate melt, right? The kind of thing that we have with clay fired up to high temperatures. And uh, magically, it turns out that there's actually quite a bit of technical literature in the material science field, which was not motivated by art ceramics at all. It had something to do with uh, kind of, I think, kind of passing ideas about how to make uh, kind of fine technical ceramics for, for uh, high technology uses, not for art uses. But um, some people worked out that, um, in, and primarily I've been reading papers from, from Reed Cooper's group, that in fact, they, they have seen that something like this happens, that if you take um, a material that's aluminum, silicon, iron, oxygen, and some other stuff, you fire it up to very high temperatures where it's basically liquid. So you're, uh, you're at, you take it up to temperatures that are high above its um, glass transition temperature, as you call it. At those high temperatures, atoms are able to move around quite a bit. And so if at the high temperature part of the firing, the kiln atmosphere is in reduction, meaning that you kind of have a lot of wood in the kiln and um, the, the uh, pull of the chimney is actually not able to bring enough oxygen into the kiln atmosphere to balance out the amount of uh, combustible gas that the wood is giving off, then mostly what's in the kiln is combustible gas and not enough oxygen, right? But burning is the combination of combustible gases with oxygen. So you've got all these hot combustible gases in there. There's an excess amount of it. They're looking for oxygen. You're not giving it enough oxygen um, by air leaking into the kiln. So what it'll do instead is it'll, try, it'll start to steal oxygen from the surface of your ceramics. And so when you're in high temperature reduction like that, there are, you know, there's iron in the surfaces of your pots, but it's now being depleted of oxygen because of the way that you have the kiln atmosphere at the very high temperatures. So you sit there for a long time and you just deplete a lot of the oxygen out of the uh, iron that's in your clay surface. And now you're done with your firing and you start to cool. And so the thing that people know from just from craft practice about how to get these reduction cool reds is that what's very important is to keep the kiln atmosphere in reduction, right? So you keep cutting off the oxygen coming into the kiln, even during the early parts of the cooling. And it's only at late parts of the cooling that you allow some oxygen to come back in. So the thing that these material scientists have figured out is that if you have reduced oxygen in an aluminum silicate belt, right? So you have this iron that's been depleted of oxygen in this clay-like surface. If you allow it to reoxidize at a high temperature, what ends up happening is that oxygen is able to just go into the surface and it will just find the iron wherever it is and reoxidize the iron kind of inside the clay. On the other hand, if you delay the reoxidation until a lower temperature, right, which is what we do by this practice of reduction cooling, then, you know, by the time you get to those lower temperatures, the surface of your pot is getting kind of stiff and tacky. It's not as liquid anymore. So if the Rita oxidation doesn't occur until those lower temperatures, uh, oxygen can't actually go into the glass to try to find the oxygen, uh, try, sorry, to try to find the iron. But what happens again, uh, what happens instead for um, somewhat exotic reasons is that it's easier for the iron to come up to the surface and get reoxidized at the surface, right? So this gives you exactly that kind of force that I was talking about where you're actually able to pull iron from the depths of the clay up to the very surface it gets reoxidized there, and the oxidized iron is this, you know, substance we know as red iron oxide, which is makes what makes these piles of uh, small rubble crystals, um, which with our eye we see is this very bright red. 
Um, so uh, I want to just uh, only talk for a couple more minutes so I don't go too long. But you know, these kinds of studies and other related ones that um, I don't have time to cover right now, you know, they really emphasize how processes that you might study in material science or even in, in mineralogy and, and in geophysics, um, those kinds of processes that happen in, in nature, those are uh, pretty much the same kinds of processes that happen for us, even in such an ancient um, craft practice as wood-fired ceramics. And this is a picture I really like to show where, you know, here's a, a, one of our test pieces from, from the work that Dan and I have been doing sitting on the bottom. And this little nugget that's sitting on top of it, that's actually a piece of scoria that I picked up from a volcanic debris field in Iceland. And so I like to say of this photo that, you know, one of these things was fired in a kiln, the other one was fired in a volcano. <laughs> Do you really see the kind of visual resonances between the sorts of surface textures that you have uh, between those two uh, artifacts? And so we kind of come back around at the end after we've thought about the firing process and how that generates either, you know, minerals and rocks on the one hand or the surfaces of our wood fire pots on another. You come back to this very strong resonance between um, the kind of uh, micro landscape or landscape in miniature that you have on wood fire and ceramics and the actual geological landscape that you can uh, see in many places around the world. So um, just in the last few minutes, I just wanted to mention some things related to the academic context that, uh, you know, doing all this, I would say that, you know, this kind of um, microscopy study, I was really motivated by this initially, just out of pure curiosity of experiencing wood firing just as, a, in, as, uh, as, a, as an art process and wondering about it and making use of the kinds of facilities that we had at Stanford to try to understand better what was going on. But in recent years, I've really become excited about integrating that kind of investigation into the undergraduate teaching that I do. So there's one class that I've started teaching. Um, I've only just offered it once, but we're going to do it again, um, where there's a class that we've uh, done in collaboration with the art conservators from the uh, Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, where you can use very similar techniques with the optical and electron microscopes to study the processes by which paintings degrade. And so uh, we offered a little class in which some students trained up on how to use the scanning electron microscopes and were able to actually study some samples from 16th century uh, uh, portraits that are being conserved at the, at the De Young uh, Museum and to try to provide some information of use to the art conservators there. Um, I've also a few times now offered a course that I call the questions of clay. And so this is a reverse kind of thing where rather than thinking mainly about the role that science tools can play in assisting, uh, uh, in helping to solve problems that come out of the art world, this class is actually a little bit the opposite where it's really a, a class about creative process. And what I try to do is to have students practice a certain kind of approach to uh, creative practice in the ceramic studio, making work, firing work, studying, studying what happens. So they kind of learn some approach to creative process in a, you know, in a, in a low stakes kind of environment where they can uh, you know, not be afraid to, to mess things up. But then I try to illustrate to them by example at the same time in, in, uh, in lectures and classroom discussions, how actually exactly that same kind of creative process can help to guide you through other kinds of research, including uh, scholarly research or, or scientific research. And then um, for the first time just this past autumn, actually during uh, COVID time, so teaching over Zoom, uh, I offered a course which is now trying to look at weaving, hand weaving and computer science. So I shipped out some looms to students and over Zoom video, <laughs> these students learned how to do some uh, hand weaving on a loom. But then I kind of used that as an entry point to also um, explain some ideas about computer science, about um, patterns and complexity and things like that. So students were able to kind of feel this connection between modern technology and traditional craft. And then um, one last thing that's uh, just gonna get going this summer, so I haven't actually done this yet, uh, but um, this summer I'm gonna offer a small class on Indigo. Uh, so we have a little farm at Stanford. And so last year we did a trial run and I've just put another batch of seedlings into the ground, um, but we're growing Indigo plants. So Indigo is a natural dye. And so in this class, I'll have students um, raising their own crop of indigo. We can use the indigo to dye textiles, to, to dye yarns, or to kind of do tie dyeing of, of uh, garments. But then there's a crazy thing that I've recently appreciated where indigo, so the dye molecule of indigo, um, it actually is also being studied by people who are interested in organic semiconductors. 
right? So in principle, you could take the material indigo that you extract from plants like this, and you can use it to make things like transistors. And so people have thought about how, wow, this would be a great thing because indigo is completely organic. So in, in principle, instead of using silicon to make your transistors, if you used indigo, you could make um, electronics that were edible or completely biodegradable. So I don't exactly know uh, how we're gonna try to tie those two things together in the summer, but that's, uh, that's gonna be my, my project for a few months from now. Um, but it's again, just another example of this kind of way that um, you know, I'm, I'm getting excited about trying to do teaching that bridges between um, traditional craft processes and the kind of studio side of art and um, other things which we normally think of as belonging to the, the STEM side of campus. Uh, so this is just a final thought I would leave here on this slide. Um, you know, there's an indigo dyed textile. This is something that I do uh, also somewhat. I do some hand weaving and indigo dyeing, and then a, a fired ceramic piece. And this is this is sort of a piece for the future. You know, I, I noted that uh, sometimes in wood fired ceramics you'll get um, these very deep blue gray uh, patches, which uh, as potters we tend to refer to this as carbon trapping. Um, I find them similar in a way to the color of very deep indigo. And then a, a, an interesting thing about indigo is, you know, I was just talking about the reduction full reds on ceramics, which have everything to do with oxygen and reduction and uh, what gets oxidized when and where. And it turns out that the indigo dyeing process is also, the indigo dyeing process is also very dependent on oxid oxidation when it happens. And that kind of determines where the, the blue indigo uh, dye will actually stick, where it will turn into a pigment. So I feel like, you know, these, lines of investigation can kind of weave in and out of each other. And I think uh, there's a lot more stuff left to do. In addition to thinking about the role of iron in color processes and ceramics, I think the role of carbon is one that um, where we still have a lot to learn. And uh, yeah, I think I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, leave it at that um, and uh, maybe turn it over now to, to some questions and such. So Gina, Thank I don't you. know how you want to, sure, like to I can help you okay. uh, go through the questions. Thank you for the presentation. Um, it seemed like through the chat, um, everybody has been pretty amazed <laughs> about your work. Um, so um, the first question is from one of our faculty and she asked, do you have a particular clay origin for your works? For instance, you are mentioning volcanic, volcanic sources. Um, interesting earth materials um, such as, oh, I'm, I'm not even gonna. Yeah, I guess I can, yeah, so I've just opened up the Q&A window so I, I, can, I can see okay. something of that. I, you know, maybe uh, as a summary sort of response, um, you know, I wondered if anybody was gonna ask where the clay comes from that I use. Um, so I have been using a clay body that's basically a 50-50 mix of two clays from the Northern California region. And so kind of where we are, um, the places where there are large clay deposits is gold country. So kind of the, the same parts of California that were the gold rush, that's where you can now uh, find clay. So there's a clay called Lincoln 8 and another clay called the Edwin clay. So these are things that I'll buy in large dry bags and then just kind of mix together to make clay. But, uh, you know, for instance, you can look up on Google where exactly the Lincoln clay comes from. Here's a Google satellite photo of it. I'd love to get out there one day and, and take some landscape photography. Um, but, you know, I think like this particular clay, it exerts an in, its influence on some of the fired pieces. I don't know if you can quite make out, but there's a kind of a dark speckling um, through this fired surface. And the, the Lincoln clay has quite a lot of our iron speckle in it. You know, so that's something that really, it's something that's a character of the clay in the ground that also kind of asserts itself on, on the surfaces of the clays. And, you know, so these clays that we're working with, um, you know, if you're wood firing, you usually do fire to these very high temperatures, so 1300 Celsius. And so they're normally kaolinitic types of clays um, in order to be the sorts of clays that will survive to those really high temperatures. I was just going to ask you that the clay has to be um, like a high fire clay, right, to be able to survive your your firing process. Yeah, so you know, for uh, terms that people might be familiar with in the studio, you're usually firing to at least cone seven eight, and parts of the kiln in a wood firing will typically get to more like eleven twelve, 
Um, so it's good if you have, it's good if you use clays that can, that will be okay at a wide range of uh, final temperatures. Okay. Um, in the beginning, you were showing the, the um, kiln and somebody asked, um, how high does that chimney go outside of the roof? If you oh, can estimate. That, that's interesting. I mean, I think, you know, the, you're, you're usually going up 15 feet at least. And I mean, it, it varies quite a bit. So, you know, depending on what altitude you're at, like I think if you're at higher altitude, you want a taller chimney. I, I, I should say I'm not a real expert in kiln design, so I don't have these numbers just off the top of my head. I'm just trying to think about when I'm standing next to the chimney, how tall is it? Um, but yeah, I, you know, I think you'll, you'll tend to have a chimney that's at least 15 feet high or so. Um, and I think around that same um, time in your presentation, uh, you're talking about your kiln furniture. And so there's a question, um, do, you, do you reuse it? And um, how many firings can it take on average? Um, <laughs> That's interesting. Yes, you know, so the kiln furniture, there are several different kinds of materials that people produce the kiln furniture with. Um, you know, some of the, the posts and things, just, you know, the same super duty fire brick that you use to build the walls of the kiln, you can cut those up and use them for posts, sort of the stilts that hold up the shelves and, and the stacks. The shelves themselves, many people like to fire with silicon carbide shelves. That's a, that's a common material that's able to take those very high temperatures. I actually really don't like silicon carbide shelves for wood firing because if those shelves accumulate some ash, they'll tend to strongly reduce that ash and you'll get these bright blue drips that fall down from your shelves onto things. And I hate the look of those drips on, on wood fire pots. Some people love it, but I, I hate it. So I usually don't use silicon carbide. Other, other shelves are just made out of very high temperature clays or clay-like substances like malite or cordite. And I think, you know, clays, the shelves are kind of expensive. So typically you want to invest in shelves that are gonna give you at least a few dozen firings before they start to warp or crack. And what many people do is that there are some places like um, at Utah State University, you can sign up on a waiting list with Kohler, um, you know, the, the, port, the sanitary porcelain company. Um, they will um, donate to institutions, I think just for the cost of the shipping. They'll donate used shells from their in, from their um, factories, which are still quite usable, but you know maybe have passed the point where they want to risk using them in their production lines. But you know those shelves at Utah, they start to warp and bend and crack. But I think they go through many dozens of firings before they give out. That's interesting about uh, Co Kohler. Yeah, Kohler is actually a great supporter of the ceramic arts. It's an artist residency at Kohler. Oh wow. Um, we have a shout out to the earth tones. <laughs> um, I think you mentioned, but um, there's a question about peak temperatures in the kiln. Um, and how long does it take to get it after the initial firing? So I imagine. So, yeah, I mean, how, how, yeah, so how fast maybe. can you take the temperature up? I mean, I think there's a general, I think it's generally true that if you fire really fast and for a short period of time, if you're not using glazes, your, your colors will tend to be not very vibrant. So I think most people that wood fire like to wood fire for at least a day, if not two days. But I think, you know, a lot of these things that I've been showing have been in fires that were only 24 or 30 hours, that kind of thing. Um, you know, on the way up, if you climb in temperature too fast, you risk having some pieces, especially in the front of the kiln break. Um, so that's, that, that's a concern. That's something that you have to mind. And also in a wood kiln, you know, because the chimney is really the engine of your firing, like the, chim the draw of the chimney is what pulls air into the firebox. And so it acts like a bellows wood in, in a fireplace that you're interested in to really kind of uh, energize the fire and get it hot. But you know you can only sort of heat up the kiln and heat up the chimney so fast. So in fact, I, I think in most kilns it's really hard to get up to cone ten sorts of temperatures. You know, 23, 2400 degrees Fahrenheit. It's really hard to get up there in much much less than eighteen hours or something like that. Right. Um, this is from our mathematics chair. <laughs> um, Okay, if I understand chemistry reduction is the opposite of oxidation, um, it would mean that the little specks on your pods um, or on the ceramics 
um, the little specks of iron are the opposite of what happens when iron rusts? Uh, interesting. So, um, like, if you have pure iron, that that's that's a metal. If I take a pure iron bar and I just sort of leave it outside in the atmosphere, it'll rust. Um, and you know, some of that rust is reddish in color. Some of it's sort of like a dirty yellow. Uh, and you know, when we talk about rust, it's a mixture of oxidized iron and iron hydroxides. So basically like water combining with the iron. And in actual rust, there are a number of different compounds that actually form, um, uh, but iron oxide is among them. And then a whole family of iron hydroxides. So that, you know, the red uh, surfaces that we're talking about or the tiny little red crystals that we showed on the hexagons, those are um, uh, hematite. So it's uh, Fe, uh, Fe2O3. Okay. Um, and I was I was wondering this too, but somebody asked, um, does the color go only on the surface, or have you seen it go deeper? And I think you showed like a cross section, kind of a or a little um, test tile. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't know if I. Oh, actually, if you look at um, these test tiles at the back here, the color is really on the surface. Right. Um, you know, at least the interesting colors that we think about. And it can be a really thin slice of the surface, like 50, 100 microns, something like that. Like only in a really long firing will you see much of the color go more like a, even a millimeter in. So you can see here the like just where the where the kerf has chipped a little bit from the diamond saw. If the red surface is really just the skin, and underneath that in this firing, the interior of the clay is gray, showing that we had a nice reduced firing. If you had an oxidized firing, actually this piece over here is from an oxidized firing, and then the interior of the clay is more of an ochre color. That slide is fascinating. That one was um, <laughs> fired it within a volcano, and the other in a kiln. Yeah, yeah, and that's a you know, and this uh, so that this little chunk, you know, was picked up from a region like this. So if you walk up in some of the high uh, volcanic fields in in Iceland, some of the really recent ones, they're still just like this is what the ground looks like. Um, you have a lot of, uh, thank you for the presentation. Your artwork is beautiful. Um, lots of that. Um, there's a question. So after the firing process, is it necessary to anneal the pieces to avoid internal stresses. What physical observables properties are you most commonly used to make art? I I um, in, in terms of annealing, so yeah, um, pots are a lot more ceramic. Ceramics are ge are generally much more robust than say glass. I know the people who work in glass. You know, even after you've taken the glass up to its highest temperature, you know, people who work in really thick glass sculptures, they might need to anneal their pieces for two months before they take them out of the kiln. But I, I think with ceramics, you know, you can bring them down in temperature really pretty quickly. Um, you know, we often talk about the cooling process. Well, let's see. So, you know, I talked about these red colors that form on the surface in terms of like moss or lichen growing on the stone. And I also mentioned about how, like, at least in these reduction cool reds, you know, there's this process where the iron is migrating up to the surface and forming these thick layers of, of iron oxide. And it really is the kind of thing I think where the more time you give this stuff to grow, the thicker and more intense your color can be. But you know, it only grows like in a certain zone, right? You need to be in the right temperature zone and the right kind of reduction oxidation zone. So a lot of the speed of the cooling, I think, has to do with trying to get the pots to spend enough time in, in the zone that you want for these uh, color processes to happen. Now, after that, you know, the one thing that we tend to worry about is around a thousand degrees Fahrenheit, there's the quartz transition. Um, so this is something that most studio ceramics people know that they'll, there's this amazing thing when you've opened up, you know, when you're cooling a kiln and you're, if your thermometers in there tell you that it's around a thousand degrees, often you'll hear these very discrete little events where there's a sudden scraping sound. Like it sounds like somebody's taking a brick and scraping it across another brick. And I've often interpreted those as that's when you've got a shelf sitting on a post. And as that surface is going through the quartz transition, you know, the, your, all of your ceramic stuff will shrink slightly as it goes through, uh, through, as it goes through the quartz transition. And so things will kind of slide on each other just a tiny bit. So we do, I mean, the only time that I've ever had pieces break on me 
is if I take them out of the kiln above a thousand degrees, then I've had things crack. But other than that, I think they're pretty robust. The one exception to that being that, you know, a lesson that many of us learned the hard way, I learned this the hard way, that um, if you don't put enough feldspar in your clay body, um, you can get the formation of something called cristopolite in your pots when you fire them. Cristopolite goes to a really strong phase transition at something more like three or 400 degrees. And so you can have this awful experience that they'll take your pots out of the can, they'll be fine. They'll be sitting on the shelf even for weeks, but there's all this built up stress in them from the shrinking of the cristopolite. And then at some point you'll tap them and all of a sudden the piece will shatter or just these giant cracks will, will propagate through them. And so that, that is the one thing where I'm not sure that annealing would even necessarily help that much, but um, I don't know, those are, those are the things that that question maybe ask about, uh, maybe think about. Had that happen and I never knew what the reason was, <laughs> not recently, but um, like I remember I had a, a pot that I was using or a bowl and I was using it um, for a paintbrush with water and it just exploded like months after it was made. It was, yeah. Or cracked, I mean not exploded, but. Yeah, some, sometimes sometimes that can be a result of um, a lack of fit between the glaze and the clay body. Like if the glaze and the clay body contracted differently when they cooled, but usually if you get a crack going through the whole piece, that's usually a crystal blade. Okay. Um, um, I guess the last uh, question or request is if um, we can see your studio. <laughs> that's sure. <laughs> Gina knows this because I gave him the studio tour just before we, we got on. Uh, yeah, so this is my, um, uh, you know, we moved out of the house at some point when I was on sabbatical and had to put all our furniture in storage. And so when we moved back into the house, they kind of made a decision that I was going to try to put all the stuff that I really like, the stuff that I really wanted to use on a day-to-day -day basis all in one little room. So this is my office where I do all my academic work. I sit here at my computer, do emails, do my teaching. Most of the books that I need for the quarter are stacked up in messy piles around the room. But then um, I also have, uh, if we go around from where my desk uh, faces, you can go around this way. Uh, so here's my floor loom. It's a, it's a little way of spring, I really like it. And if you go around a little bit more, it's bookshelves where I got book stuff. And there's my little parlor's wheel, it's a Shinpo Whisper. And you know that's that's my studio. <laughs> and then back there, a shelf with old pots and a bunch of cones of yarn and stuff like that. Very nice. Thank you. Yes. I put you on the spot there. <laughs> um, okay. Well, um, I guess we should um, um, conclude there. I would I would love to talk to you till forever but uh <laughs> we should move on i guess um so thank you very much for your presentation and for sharing your day and your knowledge with us um sure, no problem. can i just ask somebody was also asking is the is there going to be a recording of this talk somewhere so we are currently recording um and we are streaming live to facebook so it will be on facebook it's currently on facebook um in order for us to release the video, we have to caption it and do all of these things. So um, right. um, time time for us is limited. <laughs> um, so the currently the only recording will be on Facebook. Okay, um, sounds good. And we are doing a little giveaway. So thank you so much, Hideo. Um, Thanks very much. Uh, we are we have some faculty presentations um, coming up and Anna Nauman is going to introduce those. We also have a giveaway um, that Betty is going to <laughs> um, grace us with. <laughs> Hi everybody. So we're gonna real quick get to the giveaway. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. So I already copied everybody's names and there's a lot of entries, but there's only 47 of y'all right now. So you have to be present to win. Um, so let me go ahead and pay some. So everybody's here and let's shuffle a couple times. So winner number one. <laughs>
Let's see if you're here. I can tell if you're here, so they can't lie. <laughs> Stephanie Flores. Is Stephanie Flores here? Let me see. You can check, right? No. No? Okay, then we're going again. So let's remove. And <laughs> let's try again. I wanted to remove people that I didn't see, but then I'm like, what if they came back? No, Zomu, she no hard. Yes? No. No? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm gonna work on this um, to make it better next time. <laughs> so only people that are here enter. Let's see. Mia Brianna. I love that, um, the screaming. I know. <laughs> Are they here? Can you check? No, I guess maybe one more try. And if not, then we'll just keep all our goodies. Okay. Come on, let's go. We can try again after this presentation. <laughs> sure. Elizabeth Hollenbeck. Oh, I have it on here. Oh, yeah, yes! she's here. <laughs> Yay. Okay, so we got one winner. <laughs> so we'll remove you. And let's hope next winner is here. It's right in the middle. Annalisa Vera. <laughs> yes, yes, they're, they're here. <laughs> Congratulations. Awesome. I'll go ahead and send you a chat right now. Congratulations. And thank you for coming to our webinar. Thanks, Betty. How do I get out of here? Stop sharing. Miss okay. Anna Nauman. Hi, everyone. So I'm Anna Nauman. Um, first, I would like to thank all the faculty that helped us put this together. Students submitted amazing work like pictures with poetry, showing us art in, the, in their labs, or creating outstanding artwork like a crocheted cell. Mr. Leonard and his students created a whole installation with ceramic work. Dr. Cortez and her team transported a case with scientific equipment. Dr. Cervantes and her team brought insects and microscopic images of them. Dr. Nandigam and his team created cool videos showcasing their weather tank machine, beautiful rocks, and a machine that show wavelengths using sand at different frequencies. So everyone has come together to make this a special and successful event. So for those of you uh, watching, if you haven't checked out our exhibit here at Pecan Campus, you should definitely stop by. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to type it in the chat so we can address it after each of their presentations. So first up, we have the physics department chair, Dr. Nandigam. Hi, everyone. Um, how are you all doing? Um, I'm going to share a screen. I have a PowerPoint presentation. So uh, I'm going to see if I can share that. Okay. All right. Okay. Can you all see the uh, PowerPoint presentation? Yes. Yeah, great. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, that was a fascinating presentation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Mabuchi, for uh, taking the time. Um, I think it's important for our students to see how um, uh, you know uh, science and art, um, you know, uh, the relevance between these two different, uh, apparently two different fields. But uh, uh, so uh, Dr. Mabuchi very finely uh, discussed, you know, his personal experience in in this in this area. Um, so uh, today I just want to uh, share some information about the department, our department. Um, I'm the department chair for the uh, uh, Department of Physical Sciences and Engineering. Uh, we offer the department um, 
uh, associate uh, of science degree in physics and also uh, associate of science degree in engineering. Uh, we have 15 full-time regular faculty members in the department and um, uh, uh, five uh, dual credit uh, and, our, and our adjunct faculty members. So just to uh, let you know that our degree programs now are uh, available online. Um, if you need more information, uh, please contact me. Now in the department, we uh, try to acquire a set of the, uh, uh, you know, our ex uh, you know, experiential equipment. I have some examples here. Um, uh, like Anna just mentioned, uh, uh, we prepared some videos using our weather in a tank operators, um, and, uh, and and we continue to acquire some uh, uh, you know uh, concept uh, demonstrating equipment continuously. We also see here a state of the art three D printer, um, and you see some examples for three uh, D printed materials and structures uh, in the bottom area. You know those. Uh, 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 in, in, in white and, uh, and red. Uh, we also have a, a portable um, handheld X-ray fluorescence analyzer, uh, which, which can analyze and, and detect the uh, elements, uh, trace elements uh, in any type of material in, in just like 10 seconds or less. And you also see uh, uh, electronic charge to mass ratio operators. So, um, these are uh, some examples for a state of the art experiment uh, material that we that are available to the students, um, you know, in, in the courses. Uh, we have, um, uh, you know, access to active learning um, classrooms. We have uh, laboratory spaces available for our courses. We are in the process of getting um, electric car workshop for our engineering program. Um, we're also trying to get multi-purpose geology uh, um, classrooms. We have uh, uh, club activities also in the department, uh, engineering and discover science club. Uh, before the pandemic, they were, uh, they were active. Um, so I wanna share some of the uh, activities our students were involved in. Uh, this comes from uh, 2019, our uh, student team was placed first in the electric car, electric car competition, um, green energy electric car competition. Um, so many, you know, nearby universities competed and, and STC was placed first. And this electric car was developed, uh, manufactured by the, by the students, right? And in 2020, four of our, uh, our uh, department majors participated in a, a, a you know, sponsor paid uh, research internship um, and we also had uh, four STC majors to uh, uh, additional cohort. Uh, I, I, my understanding that about five students participated in another NSF sponsored um, grant program. And this is hosted by STC, uh, uh, the, the division, our division. And uh, so this is the photograph, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, this photograph has those uh, five engineering majors who participated in uh, uh, NSF sponsored uh, STEM Academy that our division hosts. And uh, most recently, uh, we had another uh, department major selected for uh, uh, international aid and space program. Uh, and so she will most probably, uh, you know, work with the NASA experts, uh, you know, for this um, uh, project. Now uh, we have our faculty members involved in um, some some uh, type of research. You know, talk to your uh, if you're a, a physics or engineering major. Talk to your faculty members if you're interested in conducting um, any, any research. And we also recently hosted uh, advising days um, uh, during which uh, our faculty members and staff members uh, demonstrated uh, activities. Uh, you know, uh, demonstrating like uh, concepts, uh, like physics uh, concepts and some engineering concepts. And we also had presentations by um, uh, transfer uh, representatives, representatives from transfer universities like UTRGV, Tamuk. So our, our graduates, uh, by the way, we have, we are graduating 56 uh, department majors this semester in spring. Um, our, our 
you know, more popular transfer universities are ETR, GV, and Texas A&M Kingsville. Uh, recently, we entered in a, a transfer agreement with uh, Arizona State University. This university offers uh, Bachelor of Science um, programs, in, in, especially in engineering, and, and there is a physics program available as well, right, for, uh, for a bachelor, uh, last two years of bachelor's program. So, so those, are, those are a few things I wanted to share uh, with, uh, with all of you. You know, um, it's if, my recommendation for if you're, if you're a student here at STC, you know, plan, uh, enroll and graduate, right? So sooner than later, if your time and resources permit, plan ahead of time, you know, many courses you need to uh, complete um, to get your degree. Ha you know, they have prerequisites, so you can't com complete all of them in one semester, right? So uh, plan ahead of time so you can take the you know, these courses in a sequence, and so you can uh, graduate in, in a reasonable amount of time. So plan, enroll, and, and graduate, right? So that's, that's what uh, um, I, I, want to, I want to leave you with, that idea. So now, if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer. Um, so are there any, uh, did I stop sharing? You're no. still sharing. Okay, okay, there, there you go. Yeah. Hmm. I haven't seen any questions yet. Okay, so, well, uh, I'm, uh, I'm here at Pecan Campus, uh, room 148. I will post my uh, contact information in the chat area in case if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you so much, Dr. Nandigam. Thank you. Next up, we have Mr. Leonard, who is a ceramic and art instructor. Actually, I don't see him. So we'll skip over and we'll go to Dr. Cortez and she is the chemistry department chair. Dr. Cortez, you're on mute. Here we go, there we are. Hello everybody. Um, I am going to also share a powerful presentation. I, I hope you enjoyed the presentation this afternoon. I know I did. It was very, very interesting. Uh, it's nice to see the collaboration between science and art. I'm going to share my screen here. I have a small presentation as well. Let's see if I can get it started. Can y'all see my screen? Can you see the screen? Yes. All right, super. Um, again, I am uh, the department chair of the chemistry program. Um, we're a relatively new department. We got split from the physical science department this past year. We currently have 10 full-time regular faculty and four dual, dual credit faculty. Our mission as a department is to provide high quality education in chemistry and pre-pharmacy. Uh, we find the pre-pharmacy program is also located in our department as we share a lot of the same courses. Uh, our goal is to provide engaging lectures, dynamic hands-on experience, introduce students to state-of-the-art instrumentation that is used in industry and in research today. Um, we prepare our, our, our graduates to have the knowledge that they need for their upcoming classes. We try to develop the confidence and the skills that are needed for students to succeed when they transfer to four-year institutions and enter the workforce. Um, the skills that are gonna be developed when you're taking a chemistry course is you really learn how to solve problems. Sometimes you find that experiments don't work the way you want them to work or, and so you need to kind of be creative about trying to find solutions to those problems. Uh, we do do a lot of technical writing and communication, um, getting students ready to present at conferences, developing PowerPoints, uh, and also putting together some poster presentations. We reinforce teamwork and in our laboratories, our students work together uh, and they work independently as well so that they can get that hands-on experience. 
uh, uh, we do promote critical thinking and analyzing the results when you get those results. Chemistry is math based. So yes, you're gonna get a chance to reinforce those math skills that you've learned. Now, again, that's true for our first two courses, the general chemistries. The organics are, are more of a visual learning. You get to see the 3D geometry of the structures. Um, our instructors do try to uh, include some hands-on real world examples. Uh, we prepare our students, some of our students are engineering students that are having to take chemistry and they want to study ma materials aspects of it. So we, want, we include those type of examples in our lectures. We do have a state of the art instrumentation that our students actually get to use. We have a, one of our students that just graduated working on the, on the IR spectrum on the top. And we have our students also recording some NMR. And these techniques help them determine the um, structure of a compound that they happen to have just synthesized or extract from plants or, or some other means. We do offer two associate's degrees, the chemistry associate degree and the pre-pharmacy associate degree. The students that major in chemistry can go on to the workforce. They can become pharmacists. They would require, of course, admittance into pharmacy school. And these are the salary ranges that are currently here in the Rio Grande Valley. A pharmacist can make uh, in the mid 150s. Um, you got a chemist, a uh, large of them working in the USDA, they get a, about $84,000. You got petroleum engineers, some biochemists, and some chemical engineers, and environmental scientists. These are degrees that money came, uh, the, the, the salaries came from available resources here in the Rio Grande Valley. We do have transfer opportunities for our students. We have articulation agreements in chemistry with UTRGV, so our courses are transferable. We also are working on one with Texas A&M in Kingsville, hoping to finalize that one in the coming year. We do have memorandums of understanding with the College of Pharmacy at Texas A&M in Kingsville and the University of Houston. Uh, we have the um, University of Houston, we have an early admissions co-op with students with about 15 hours uh, to 45 hours can get accepted um, before they're finishing all their, their prerequisites and they get mentored along the way. We have a, an agreement with Texas a and Kingsville as well as our students meet certain criteria, they, are, they qualify for an automatic interview. We uh, do have a understanding with the University of uh, UT, excuse me, at San Antonio. And they have an uh, MOU where they accept our courses, the course for course um, agreement. Currently, our students are able to get scholarships through the NSF STEM Academy. That is a division of uh, NSF grant that was received. Dr. Nandiga mentioned it a little bit earlier. Uh, and, and the cohorts that have been selected consist of students from the different STEM majors here at South Texas College. Our department does offer some uh, work study employment opportunities. So if you're interested in, in, in working in a science lab uh, and you're a student, we welcome your application. We do have a uh, direct wage lab assistant positions that we bring in from time to time, have students help us in the lab, work directly with our lab specialists and helping to prepare the labs for students that are currently in our courses. We do have two clubs. Um, that are very, very active, the Chemistry Club and the Pre-Pharmacy Club. And I want to share some of the work that they've been doing. Our students in the Chemistry Club are very, very active in going out to our local schools. And what they have is a, a traveling chemist where they go and they do demonstrations for students at the elementaries. We celebrate National Chemistry Week. They do a fundraising uh, food drive to take to uh, the Rio Grande Food um, Food bank, and then our students are actually go out and present at different places some of the work that they're doing. So it's a very, very active club. They have things go. Oh, Dr. Avila is the main sponsor, and they they actually every semester they come up with new activities and how to engage the community in chemistry. Our pharmacy club does something as well. They they take our students to the different hospitals. They get to meet some of the. Uh, doctors working here. They also go to the um, nursing homes and, and, and volunteer there. They, this, this semester, they managed to collect some blankets for some of the residents of the nursing homes to try to make sure that 
everyone was able to get through this winter storm that we had earlier this, this year. We have our students participating and visiting on trips to Texas a and Kingsville. They've gone to Incarnate Ward. They go to uh, University of Houston, and this is up here is the University of Houston, giving them a preliminary lecture to give them an idea of what it would be like in pharmacy school. Uh, we also, as a department, and working in collaboration with the biology program and the physical science and engineering, uh, host a science Olympiad, uh, um, where it's a competition for both middle school and high school students to come here to SDC. This year, we had our first virtual, virtual competition where the students can be in different areas, forensics, geology, astronomy, engineering, chemistry, food science. And they get recognized that the top three get a chance to go to state. And then if they do well there, they go on to nationals. So again, we try to be very active and try to give back to the community as much as we can. Our faculty um, are always trying to connect with our students and find a way to make science more interesting and to make people more aware of the sciences in our community. Um, my contact information is here. Um, Dr. Enriqueta Cortez, you have my email. You can also find us on the webpage or our chemistry department webpage. You have a pre-pharmacy webpage and you can get to these by simply uh, typing in, in our search or you can go to the division website as well. So uh, if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. I'm trying to find my way back over here. Give me a second. Uh -oh. Give me a minute. Let me just stop sharing. Thank you so much, Dr. Cortez. Thank you. I'm just trying to get out. If you can have <laughs> stop sharing here yet, I'm trying to. There it is. There it is. I'm good. Thank you so much. Next, we have Mr. Leonard. I do apologize. I didn't see you earlier. <laughs> so Mr. Leonard okay. is a ceramic and art instructor. You're up next. Thank you. OK, so I can start like this um, and then I'll share my screen. But I'm wearing my Kurt Anderson shirt <laughs> um, and I'm operating not from STC, but the Leonard campus, which is about two miles um, straight east of Pecan. All right, so if I maximize this and share my screen, let's see. The STC Clay People's um, portion of the Involution Afternoon. Um, let's go to slideshow from the beginning, and we'll throw some art in with the science um, with a quote from Romar Bearden. And, and I think. Uh, Hideo, what a communicator, what a scientist, what an artist. Um, <clears throat> and these are a couple of my favorites, one within the field uh, of fine art, Romar Bearden, who overcame a number of obstacles uh, and worked uh, outside of art while he made art. Uh, but he has a quote that if you watch my, one of my favorite videos, Danny Glover reads it, the artist confronts chaos. The whole thing of art is, how do you organize chaos? Maybe you take a science class. Uh, and then Warren McKenzie, who's a longtime Minnesota potter, recently passed away, uh, who emphasizes process here, saying that, you know, today is Tuesday and we had a Monday, we'll have another one, but we're never gonna have yesterday, but we can learn from it. So 
the scientific inquiry and the trial and error, uh, I think ceramics is a perfect arena. Uh, I'm not, maybe all of art is, maybe all of the world is, uh, but the area that I do teach at STC is ceramics, art appreciation, 2D design, uh, and I am a recycled painter, uh, and I grew up with two brothers who uh, are engineers, uh, one with a PhD in chemical engineering and another uh, extrovert who is a chemical engineer. Uh, and most of my immediate family, they might practice art and music, but they also are very heavily involved in science. Uh, I like fiction as well as reality. So this is, you know, as some of the comments, please do go over and see this real show. Uh, this was the community effort that uh, Ceramics 1 and 2 made last spring for the Esther Pearl Watson show, which had to do with flying saucers. Uh, and we missed the deadline and um, 2020 did its 2020 thing. Uh, but with this magnificent, magical, and scientific show, it is on the wall, and I'm very proud of the 12 students uh, who made birds that combine with spaceships and fly, uh, and the HAHA -H -A is heavens above, heavens above. Uh, and I do try to tie in uh, connections and heroes, whether... They, let's see, everybody on this list, except for Kevin Snipes in the lower right, it's Kurt Anderson, uh, Ron Myers, Kevin Snipes, Richard Nickel, and Kurt Mangus. They did have the great fortune of finding a way to teach ceramics at, at a collegiate level while they made ceramics. So art was their livelihood, um, but that isn't always the case. Uh, and we have been running a South Texas ceramic showdown since at STC since 2009, and a few years before that at UTPA before it was the RGV. And here's some shots of the last time it happened. Uh, 2020 put us on the sidelines, and we're not going to have our comeback till 2022. Uh, but George McCauley, who's graced the cover of Ceramics Monthly in the late 90s, uh, came down and showed us a thing or two. Um, and Melissa Mancini, who's grew up um, in Ohio, but uh, is Austin based and was actually talking about expanding her skill set uh, by going back into nursing, uh, also showed us a thing or two. And, and actually, it's kind of interesting because here's Max Butler in the background, and he was one of our presenters. We have been running this two person show, and it's open to anybody in the community. In fact, if you look closely, this is Gina right here. She's on her phone, but she's probably telling people to uh, come on in. And the professionals who have found a way to continue to make art and make a living in or outside of art uh, have the stage or have the, the classroom uh, at STC in Building B, the art building, where we can and do do a lot. And then they also have their show uh, in the library. So if you're interested, you can see the history of shows because I think the SDC Library Art Gallery does a fantastic job with the PR. And look, there's Max Butler uh, again at the opening. But while that's going on, uh, in Building B, and this has been the summertime, kind of the off season here in South Texas because it's hot, but I think Hideo talked a little bit about how hot ceramics gets. Uh, we run an invitational show. So here's a box coming in, I believe from Louisiana, and here's work that was driven in from Kingsville. And the interesting twist on this, I think this has also been presented uh, by Hideo and by our folks at STC, uh, a community and a collective uh, joining. And so it's kind of a team effort. And each school can put up to, each school invited, and I try to base it on the pedestals we have. If, we're, if it were track, I would invite eight teams and get confirmation because the track has eight lanes. But with our pedestals and ceramics, we try to fill, it's, it's like the kiln, what am I gonna get? Uh, so we've had a pretty good cast of 
10 schools, some of whom are asking, are you doing it this summer? Unfortunately, uh, we're gonna have to wait. Uh, and we have an active uh, clay club that's now this, it was the South Texas Clay Club, get it, STCC. We put the C back in STC. And I think community is important, but it shifted a little bit into uh, an activity or organization called STIC, South Texas Ink and Clay, club with a K, uh, because clay is sticky. And one of the common unifiers in all of the academic programs here is uh, in order to be successful, uh, we want you to stick with it. And there's a lot of failure in clay. I think uh, anybody, uh, who has worked in clay that has had opportunities to show can show you the behind the scenes as well. And this is Alex Caminos who had been uh, helping to sponsor uh, that particular clay club uh, with his family at the opening in building B. At the same time that was going on, uh, the ST, the stick folks had a show over at the UVAL and we'd been able to do that for a number of years too. So, the art department, um, the stick people, I like to call them because that's one of the first things people are like, what, you want me to draw? I can only do sticks. It's like, well, we're the stick people. And here's a couple of shots uh, of clay pieces coming uh, in or out of the kiln. So we do low fire and we do high fire with gas. We do uh, cone O, six to 04, which is considered low fire, where a lot of it is what you see is what you get, uh, bright color, uh, the opportunity for commercial glazes. And we do mix our own clay from uh, processed mined raw materials, like making cookies as opposed to buy them. Uh, and this is a glaze fire coming out in the electric kiln. Uh, and this is a high fire going in and getting ready to fire. This is Cindy Gonzalez, who does have one of the a, a big part of the piece that's in the uh, involution show. She's not an art major. She was a nursing major. Now she's uh, shifted to criminal justice. Uh, we we have folks from a wide spectrum. A lot of the art classes have drawing as a prerequisite. Ceramics doesn't. I like to incorporate drawing, but I I call it surface magic or or. Uh, surface engagement. So this is that same firing coming out. And this is another opportunity for the stick people over at uh, McAllen Stained Glass in the Art Village, which um, is two miles from school. But there's a lot of work in ceramics behind the scenes. This, I think, is my last slide. And this is my little old 21-year-old truck now with all the stuff that if we throw pots two miles away, it's loaded up, we do it, uh, maybe the process, these get thrown back, maybe we bring them back. But the end result would be uh, these type of pieces uh, that I think I did photograph out of that show now uh, over a year ago. But Andrew Guerra, who I saw tuned in asking questions, uh, criminal justice. Uh, Ana Lourdes Hernandez, who had a variation of this scientific piece because that is a uh, functional pinhole camera. So she combined her love of photography, which is I think a bigger love than ceramics uh, to make a functional pinhole camera. One of them was accepted to the Rising Eyes of Texas, uh, which is a juried show statewide to undergraduates and graduates in art. Uh, so for us as a two-year school, man, that's a big deal. Uh, Cynthia Gonzalez with that piece, Take Me to Your Kiln, uh, which I think is fantastic. High fire sculpture is an acquired taste. And I, man, she's good at it. Um, and then Mr., what was this called? Mr., well, it could be a Jaguar. And then uh, one of our superstars, Gualberto Mania, with a, uh, 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 a, a, a paradise castle. And he's an architectural student with us. So uh, we have fun, uh, we do connect, and you can connect it a number of different ways to storytelling in English, to, to science and architecture, certainly chemistry and geology. And guess what? If, if you're a student out there or an adult and you take a class, 
I hope I could teach you something and I'm sure I'm going to learn from you. Um, so that was what I have. Hopefully I'm within the time frame. I tried 10 slides in less than 10 minutes, but um, sometimes clay has its own mind. So thank you guys. Well, thank you, Mr. Leonard. And next up we have Dr. Cervantes, who is the biology department chair. Hi, good afternoon. I'm going to try to figure out how to share my PowerPoint. Hold on. Um, I need help. <laughs> I have a PowerPoint and it's on my screen. How do I go ahead and share? There's a screen share, share button screen. Uh -huh. that's green on the bottom. Got it. Okay. Let's see. Hi, good afternoon. I'm uh, Dr. Cervantes, chair of the biology program. I'm in my office <laughs> and I'm gonna share my screen. I hope this works. And I apologize, I usually use Teams, so I'm much more familiar with Teams than I am with um, Zoom. But um, I wanted to extend uh, gratitude to the library sciences to, for putting this together. I think um, it's always refreshing to see the sciences through a different perspective, especially because uh, the sciences, as you saw, are so interconnected to everyday life. The things that we do on our uh, daily basis are all connected to the biology, chemistry, physics, uh, geology of things, right? And so with that, um, I wanna introduce the biology department. Um, we here at the biology department are always looking for ways that we can um, elevate our students to make sure that students have the best opportunities to succeed, not only within our institution um, as they forge forward into their associate's degree, but also with the intent that they'll be best prepared to um, transfer to a four-year institution and carry out their careers to um, hopefully a successful, fruitful life. So a foundation in biology should enable you to make informed decisions um, about the most important topics that in our generation have already started affecting our daily lives. I'm not gonna um, emphasize too much on it, but <laughs> we're all not in the same room together, um, partaking of some coffee and cookies because um, we had this thing COVID affect all of us. And so um, you get to learn more about these things that affect our daily life, including climate change, environmental and wildlife conservation, genetically modified foods and organisms and biomedical research which was definitely at the forefront of the new vaccines. The Associate of Science degree in biology is designed for students who plan to transfer to a four-year institution and major in biology, pre-professional or technical allied health programs. It's also the first big step for students who plan to obtain entry-level positions in related fields. And our biology courses prepare students to become excellent problem solvers with enhanced writing, critical thinking, and math skills. Um, when you get an associates of science degree with a field study in biology, you're gonna have the opportunity to take courses that provide exposure to research and clinical methods. Biology majors have a range of potential careers in different scientific and technical fields, along with the opportunity to further their education with a postgraduate degree. Exceptional foundations are made here. Um, what you'll learn with a small class sizes that we offer it ensures that our biology faculty are gonna have more interaction with our students. You're getting um, a high level of education for the fraction of a price. Um, and, but that doesn't mean that um, the level of expertise and value that you're getting is limited. Um, if anything, it's expanded with the opportunity to get to know your instructor, you get to interact in class. Uh, there's more hands-on learning. We have both indoor and outdoor lab settings. We've taken students to Quinta Mazatlan, to Sal del Rey, to several of our 
uh, nature centers around the valley, um, all the way to Sea Turtle Inc with the purpose of showing you, teaching you, and getting you excited about a career that you'll feel uh, fruitful and uh, accomplished in. So our department does provide opportunities to conduct research with partnerships, both with Howard Hughes Medical Institute, a prestigious um, institute that is known uh, worldwide, with the USDA and with um, National Institute of Health. Some of these partnerships are with UTRGV, we're looking at partnerships with Texas A&M as well. So soon enough, we'll be um, skipping a hop away from getting you onto that career that you want at an institution, a four-year institution that uh, you can continue with a great understanding and foundation from having been through our program. So these programs may result in new discoveries that benefit our community. And we're beginning to see a little bit of that as well. There's potential careers and salaries. Uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, a lot of our students do come to our program with the intent of following up in a uh, allied health uh, degree. A lot of nurses, um, people wanting to go into medical school, physical therapy, physician's assistant, uh, we can get you there. We are looking into an articulation with uh, Texas A&M Kingsville, that will hopefully provide opportunities for students interested in entering veterinary medicine. Um, they have a special program for veterinary techs, which is the new way of um, doing veterinary science. It's veterinary nursing, basically, which is that missing link uh, that we usually don't associate with veterinary science. But Texas A&M Kingsville has developed the program, the first in the nation, um, and we're articulating, forming articulation agreements so that hopefully we can get our students to uh, take advantage of this new program and um, facilitate their transfer to this institution. We're also working with uh, UTRGV, both with uh, articulation transfer agreements for biomedical science, which we currently already have a grant. It's available for all our students who are interested. Uh, there's a couple of prereqs that they have to apply um, apply for and this is to carry out research in the biomedical sciences. Uh, we're also doing an articulation with UTRGV for environmental science to their sustainability agriculture program. Um, hopefully that will also be very fruitful. We're looking at an articulation with Texas A&M for a wildlife biology uh, program as well. So all of these uh, potential careers are all um, at, the, at your fingertips basically. And we're trying to facilitate that so that you can have a great foundation and then continue on to these prestigious four-year universities or institutions to finish up your uh, degree academic career and go on to uh, have a great prosperous career um, and help out your community. So one of the programs that we spent most time developing within our biology program is a program called the CFH program. It's a program uh, that is meant for students first time in college or first time in a biology course. We really are looking for students that have limited science experience, but are interested in the possibility of learning and applying and possibly exploring a new field of uh, research where they can find success. As we saw already with our very first cohort of students. So this is a discovery-based entry-level biology course that is designed to provide students with the opportunity to participate in authentic research. Uh, the research is carried out within the course of Biology 1406, which is Biology 1, and continued with research in the second part of biology, which is Biology 2, Biology 1407. So the course is aimed at undergraduate students who are new to college level science, have little to no research experience, we want you to come with an open mind um, and explore what is uh, this world that is unknown to us because we don't see it. It's a microscopic world. Uh, so this is a two semester course sequence that prepares students to pursue research-based careers in biology. These are a couple of students from the very first cohort uh, working diligently in their discovery phase and students learned how to isolate and purify bacteriophage. And that sounds like a very uh, nasty word. It's basically understanding uh, how viruses work, how bacteria work. 
and finding a way to uh, kill bacteria, basically attack bacteria using uh, viruses. So viruses attack bacteria as well, and viruses can be used as a way to treat um, those bacteria that are antibiotic resistant. They are no longer responding to medicine, so now they'll respond to viruses. Viruses can be made to target these bacteria and kill the bacteria, and the virus itself would not be harmful to the human because these viruses only kill bacteria, thus the name bacteria phage. Phage is the Latin root word for eat. So it's a bacteria eater. Uh, and these students are looking for these in soil and trying to isolate from the soil to find these very particular viruses. Uh, they submit their findings to an online database. Once uh, they find the virus, we send them off to get pictures of the virus, which we need a very powerful microscope to do that. Um, and then we also need to identify its genes, identify its DNA sequence. And so students spend the second semester basically doing that. So you're doing, um, I mean, just the amount of level of a lab technique and skills that you're learning and applying. And the fact that this is ongoing research, um, it's not just a school project, it's one that can lead to publications and presentations and elevate your career because your resume would be very well stacked, uh, make you very competitive if you're trying to apply to those prestigious for your universities because you'd be providing um, examples of research, actual publications before you even graduate with your associates. I wouldn't be saying all this if it wasn't because it has already happened for our students. Um, so we say it, but we deliver. So we had one of our students actually on January 21st, 2020, discover a brand new bacteriophage um, and she got to name it. She named it after her last name because she wanted to honor her father, her family for their hard work in uh, keeping her focused in her studies. At 16, Daniela de la Garza has now a publication, um, including the whole class that helped contribute to the success of this discovery. So they have a publication um, in the Biomedical Science Journal and the Data Gene Bank. Um, who else <laughs> can do this at 16? I My first publication was at the age of 25. So. Um, way ahead of the curve here with uh, the opportunities that we offer within the biology department. We've been exposed on the media for these uh, great findings um, and exemplary work from the students. So we're very proud to feature them and all their success belongs to them. It really was the students working hard to get this done and it all happened within their biology course. So with that, uh, one of the first pictures that was shown at the art exhibit uh, that is going on is a picture of that famous bacteriophage. So I know it doesn't look like much, it's black and gray, but believe you me, if you think of, uh, consider of the smallest particles, this one is smaller than a hair. Um, we had not visualized viruses until the development of the electron microscope. So in line with the theme of today's um, talk, everything develops from the smallest unit. And we have captured one of the smallest units on camera. Um, at this point in society, we have gotten to the point of being able to visualize some of the smallest um, organic matter like a virus to some of the largest um, things in the universe like a black hole, but we've we're living it, we're part of that uh, society that gets to uh, see and enjoy this technology come to life. In the picture below it, you see the ge uh, genetic coding that the students uh, put together from uh, this bacteriophage. So using computer programs, they were able to find the DNA sequence of this specific bacteriophage. And we have a picture of it, so we know it exists. Um, and these are a few of the other submissions. I just want to showcase them in case you don't get a chance to come by. Very proud of the student work. Um, we have students showing a cell, a plant cell. You have a bacteria painting. So even in our classes, we exemplify the idea of putting your imagination to work. 
And a lot of times that is what is needed for us to better understand science um, and open our minds to things that we may have never experienced. Here's a few more of the exhibits. If you come by, I'm not gonna give it all away so that you'll wanna come by and visit, but there's up close views of the butterfly's wings as you can see them under the microscope. Um, you're gonna be able to see the eye of one of these moths up close, uh, the fimbriae, their little fibers on their antennae on, and on their legs. So you're gonna get, get to see those uh, up close. We took pictures of them under the microscope so that you could see the big picture and the small picture. Get to see everything from the biggest construct. We get to uh, admire the colors of the butterfly wing, but at the microscopic level, we know that those colors come from uh, iridescence and um, these little scales on the wings of the butterfly that reflect light at a, at a specific angle that are able to give us that wavelength of blue that we um, are able to identify. Um, so come visit the exhibit. There's a lot more to see. You're not going to uh, regret it. This is my contact information. For those of you who are um, on your phones, you can scan our QR code there and it'll take you to our biology uh, website. That's my contact, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, you can also look me up on the SDC website. I'd be happy to entertain any of your questions, comments, concerns. Um, come talk to me, we want you here. Come be a student in our institution and of course, come be a biology major. So thank you so much for the time. I appreciate uh, for those who are still in attendance, but uh, thank you so much to the Library Sciences for giving us the opportunity to showcase our students' work and also have the opportunity to showcase our departments. We're always looking for opportunities where we can tell the world what it is that we're doing. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, Hope you have a great evening. Um, thank you to all the panelists and speakers. Um, this has been a really great event. So, and we finished the semester. So, yay! <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>